thank you for coming today. We really appreciate you uh, coming out here. I know people are coming from off campus and having problems with parking and I'm getting emails continuously pinging in my uh, pocket. But nonetheless, I appreciate you all coming here uh, today. Um, my job is not to introduce Jean. Uh, I do want to say, though, one thing is that if I can become one-fourth or even one-third or 0.25 or 0.025 percent of what he's become in the area of cybersecurity one day, then I'm going to feel like I've done my job. Um, and I just wanted to uh, say that. Um, the other person that I can say the same about is uh, Steve Kaplan, our president. Uh, his support for us in the area of cybersecurity and digital forensics at the University of New Haven has been unprecedented. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you also uh, doing this, Steve. So without further ado, um, this is uh, Steve Kaplan. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Abe, I thank you for all you've done for the university for this program in particular for our students. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be introducing this very renowned, very well-known speaker uh, to such a nice uh, and full house. Uh, I, I, I should probably mention, Jean, that I normally uh, don't introduce uh, faculty visiting speakers. I'm often in the audience, but I don't normally introduce them. Uh, but it's not normal at this university to have someone here of your stature. And so when they said you would be speaking, I asked if I could in fact introduce you. I am, as I said, very supportive of this program. I think it has enormous uh, relevance to what we're doing here. Uh, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to have the faculty we have and have the students we have uh, helping move this initiative forward. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to recognize uh, someone very important in the audience, Bob Albine, former chairman of our board. <laughs> graciously over the years funded this very important speaker series uh, which introduces our students and faculty in the community uh, to people of this stature who come here uh, to talk about their area of expertise. So Bob, I appreciate your leadership uh, with the series and all the events of the university. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to say a little bit about Abe Gilly, who you just heard from, uh, who helped plan this event. In the short time he's been at the university, uh, he's had a transformational impact and what we're doing here in the engineering school, uh, obviously in cybersecurity in particular. Uh, many of you know he received uh, an endowed professorship this year uh, in recognition of his incredible efforts both here at the university uh, at the national level and frankly even at the global level. Uh, within two years, uh, we unveiled our new cyber forensic research and education laboratory, uh, stated our facility that equips our students uh, with cutting edge knowledge uh, and preparation. Uh, and just in the short time that program's been in place, uh, they've revealed some of the safety vulnerabilities of some of the most widely used applications uh, on the globe, including one I use quite frequently now with great paranoia, WhatsApp. <laughs> I think, was it Facebook that bought WhatsApp for $18 billion, and the next day, Abe and his students suddenly exposed the fact that it might not have been the best purchase in the, in the, in the company's history. At any rate, we were the first uh, school in Connecticut to partner with the Defense Department in the Defense Cyber Crime Center uh, that focuses on counterintelligence and counterterrorism efforts. Uh, and that brings us to today's speaker, uh, who is at the forefront of all of these initiatives. Uh, today's speaker has been critical in establishing the foundation uh, for this now incredibly thriving field of cybersecurity, uh, an industry that is projected to employ an additional one million individuals this year. That means there is something like, if I'm doing my math correctly, uh, probably about, what, 100,000 jobs for everyone in the room over the coming decade. In other words, there's plenty of opportunity here. Dr. Spafford, again, who's widely credited with bringing this field into the national forefront uh, through his research and teaching, is widely recognized as the nation's uh, most prominent cybersecurity expert. He's a renowned leader in the field of computing. He's been honored with nearly every possible award in the area of cybersecurity, including induction into the Cybersecurity Hall of Fame. Dr. Spafford and his students are credited with a number of security firsts, including the first open security scanner, the first widely available intrusion detecting tool, and some of the first work in vulnerable
vulnerability classification databases. His accomplishments are extraordinary. Uh, I've reviewed his CV, which is staggering. Uh, he's got a resume uh, that is hard to find uh, in any field, let alone uh, in higher education. He's worked in, in multiple areas outside of higher education, and again, as, as a result uh, of global reputation in his field. You'll learn more about what he does from him, uh, and better from him than from me, so without any further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Jane Stafford. Well, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, Abe was a graduate student in the center that I run at Purdue University and did some great things there as a student and has continued in that tradition uh, after leaving and, and here uh, at the university. Um, met his students this morning and they're carrying on in that tradition doing some great work. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some observations on the area of cybersecurity and privacy and policy uh, that come from a perspective of having worked in this field for well, we'll say three decades. Um, and perhaps this will, will give you a little bit different insight than some of the material that you would normally be seeing uh, on uh, television or for those of you who still read newspapers uh, or, or other media. So I'm going to start and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got to where we are uh, and a little bit of a sample of where we are, uh, some of the issues and uh, a few thoughts about uh, what's next, what we're facing, and uh, some of the issues that we're going to have to confront. And I'm not going to give you a lot of solutions because there are some paths for a solution, but they're complex. Instead, I'm, I'm hoping to finish with some time, perhaps for some questions and some uh, interaction with you uh, on these issues. So, the context of this is something that I've talked about over the last few years because those of us who work in computing are used to change. We are used to change both as change agents and as some extent as victims of the change that occurs. Uh, it happens very quickly and because we embrace that change, because we're riding that wave forward, we often don't have the ability, the time, or the inclination to step back and to look at what has changed to understand some of the context and some of what it has wrought. Uh, if we do, we may actually have a little bit of a different look at the future of computing and technology and how we're using it. So I step back and, and look roughly at 50 years of change. It's, it's a little bit longer. Um, but I want to start off and talk a little bit about, whoops, that jumped ahead. All right, well, that's advancing on me there without, without me hitting the button. All right. Um, so part of this is, is something related to Moore's Law and the change in technology. Uh, and this is looking at, uh, I say 55 years, it's a little bit longer than that, uh, 60 years of change in semiconductors and the way we do computing. So in 1958, which is a significant year because that was the first year that we were able to buy, or at least the general public was able to buy an all transistor computer. Transistors were invented in 1947 at Bell Labs and brought the three inventors a Nobel Prize. Uh, they were a little while to get really uh, an industrial base for transistors and IBM was an early adopter and bet the company on having an all transistor computer in 1958. If you look at the price of transistors at that time, they were about $60 a piece in modern dollars. All right, so that's adjusted for inflation and change over time. $60 per transistor. If we go forward a bit, and I use 2008 as a 50 year uh, mark for this, uh, or um, going, going forward, transistors were about 1 800 thousandth of a dollar a piece in quantity. Now they're even cheaper than that now, it's about 1 1 millionth of a dollar per transistor. 
and that's a drop of seven or eight orders of magnitude. If you look at consumer prices for almost any other technology, there is nothing, or almost nothing, that uh, has a similar drop in price over that span of years. We have taken the art of building transistors, and not even individually anymore, but uh, packaged together into ICs, uh, to a high art form, and we produce them in great quantity. And we are continuing to produce them in greater density and higher speed. Um, there we go. So one of, the, uh, one of the ways that we've measured this or we've talked about is something called Moore's Law. And Moore's Law has talked about the number of computers per chip doubling um, in, in uh, every few years. And if you plot it out on a log graph, it really does hold to that kind of a density change. Now, there are some people who believe that we're approaching a limit to Moore's Law because of physical constraints like heat dissipation and the speed of light. But we are also getting to the point where we're going to increase parallelism with multiple processors per chip. And we're beginning to talk about exotic technologies such as quantum computing. So it's not clear how much further we can project that graph out, but it's probably going to continue for some years to come. And we're going to continue to have more and more computer, uh, uh, more and more transistors per chip, per computer, and the price is going to continue to drop. Well, why is it coming back here? Ah, I'm having problems with this uh, a little bit here. So, all right, must be must be the transistors. But <laughs> so um, here's a, here's a number for you uh, for those of you who who uh, may be interested in uh, um, uh, math at, at this level. Uh, that number with all the zeros is ten quintillion. That's ten to the nineteenth, and uh, basically, this, this uh, set of slides I got from a colleague, uh, Ed Lazowska, and he pointed out that in 2004, 10 quintillion grains of rice were harvested in the world. Now, um, how do we know 10 quintillion grains of rice? Well, uh, okay, uh, grad students. Um, <laughs> We have to have uh, something for them to do and out counting rice. But if you, if you think about worldwide, you think about all the rice, uh, China and Korea and Vietnam and South America and southern part of the United States and uh, parts of Europe and Africa, it's a lot of rice, 10 quintillion grains of rice in 2004. And the reason he picked 2004 as the important year is that is the first year that the number of transistors manufactured in the year was more than the number of grains of rice produced in the world. And that number has increased every year since. It's now about a factor of, I believe, 100 more, so 10 to the 21st. Number of transistors manufactured every year. And these are manufactured in chips that are embedded in not just our computers, but watches, phones, clocks, household appliances, automobiles, real-time control for utilities and lots of other places. We have computing literally surrounding us in everything and in a scale that is difficult for some of us to imagine. We have many things that have embedded uh, RFID or radio uh, field sensors in them that have micro circuits involving transistors and we may not even see them because they're so small. The price of more transistors, they've almost come down to inconsequential levels. But that's not all. Secondary storage, which is where we store information when it's not in the main memory of the computer, has also changed in, in, in uh, remarkable ways. So back in that same 1955 time frame, um, that 2,000 bits uh, took a cubic inch to store. And that used something um, that was known as a uh, rotating drum memory. You can see them in computing museums now, should you wish. Um, but that's not very dense, if you think about a cubic inch holding 2,000 bits. And in today's constant dollars, 52,000, nearly $53,000 uh, per megabyte. That's expensive. Especially when you compare going forward to today, when uh, earlier this, this week, or last week, 
I went out and looked at some prices on Amazon for some discs that you could buy, just mail order. And it turns out that you can get about 500 gigabits per cubic inch at about a price of $2 per gigabit. So you look at that price drop, and again, we're talking many orders of magnitude here as a result of increased manufacturing and better technology and advances in science, but also greater demand. Incredible changes in the amount of storage and computing power. Those two things combined have resulted in great changes in the way we communicate and in the way that we process data. And in particular, I uh, would like you to consider that, and this is kind of a moving, a moving average that has been true for about the last decade, that if you were to go back 10 years ago and look at the internet of the time and move it forward to today, we could take the entire internet of 10 years ago and fit it on about 50 PCs in this room. 50 PCs that we would go out and buy as commodity items uh, at a Fry's, a Best Buy, or, or similar. Bring them in, set them up, entire internet, 50 PCs, room this size. We need a little extra air conditioning, but there we'd, there we'd be. If you went back 20 years ago, you could take the entire internet of 20 years ago and fit it on a single PC in this room that you would buy commodity. That entire global internet of all the data that was available of, ten, of 20 years ago. Now this has been true each year. You go back 10 years, 20 years, and it matches the, uh, the capacity. What I would like you to think about is not so much, gee whiz, how far we've come, but think about the future that many of you are going to be operating in. Because in 20 years, today's internet will fit, probably, on a single computing device. Think about today's internet, global, all of the books, all of the maps, all of the documents, all of the cat videos, <laughs> all of those on one single system that you have on your desktop or that you have maybe in a, something you carry on your belt, or maybe you have it embedded in your body somewhere. If you have all of that information, local, at hand, with all of the computing power changes that we're looking at in 20 years, what is that going to be like? What will that allow you to do that you can't do now? And why is it still going to be running Windows? <laughs> That's a challenge for you. That's something to think about. Who's designing for that future? And I would put forward that very few people are. Very few people are looking at the trends and extrapolating out and thinking about what the challenges really are going to be that we're going to have to face. Now, there's a whole lot of security and privacy challenges associated with that that I'm going to talk a little bit about. And another thing that's really important about that that I'm not even going to touch on is accuracy. You look at what's out of the internet now and an awful lot of what's out there is just plain wrong. Um, and some of it, it's hard to tell if it's wrong. You visit some of the websites of the ones about the lizard people taking over positions in the government. Uh, eh, maybe. Um, yeah, we'll see how this primary goes. But uh, if, you, uh, if you think about all that information that you're going to have available to call on, how do you know what's accurate? How do you know what's current? How do you keep it consistent? The challenges we have as computer scientists and data scientists are just huge. To give you another idea of how this change has gone, and for some of you this is, this is very uh, perhaps nostalgic, that machine there was a government installation uh, computing system at the end of the 1950s. It required a whole building for the air conditioning, the power, all of the computation. What's on the right is a picture of a greeting card uh, similar to what you can get in many stores for about uh, uh, $5.95 that you can record a greeting and it plays a tune. Um, the one that I got uh, is, is particularly uh, interesting. I sent it to a couple friends. Once it starts playing, you can't shut it off, which is a, like a lot of computer programs, actually. But um, for $5.95, you can get a card like that. And that card has more memory and processing power 
than the computer on the left that cost $18 million back at the end of the 1950s. That's a huge change. Now I want you to just extrapolate that forward for the current technologies and what you will have available to you in 20 years or 30 years. Um, here's another example I just for, for comparison. The machine on the, the left is a Cray YMP. 25 years ago it was custom built by the government for use in weather forecasting and nuclear weapons design. Uh, it was hand wired. It required special coolant. It had its own room. Uh, doubled as a piece of furniture. Uh, very, very powerful machine. On the right is uh, an iPhone 5. And it turns out that two iPhone 5s have, double, have more, than, uh, more processing power, way more memory than that Cray YMP in 25 years. What's more, their phones, cameras, music players, GPS units, and a number of other things all thrown in as well. The point being, it's more than just computing and data recovery. It's communications. It's processing. It's physical sensing. So what you will have to carry in 20, 25 years will not only have all this data and processing power, but will have other capabilities we've only begun to think about. That may include things like health monitoring, location data, uh, mesh networking with other people. To think about what we can do with that technology now is to shape what we're going to do going forward. But we have a problem, and the problem limits our imagination. And it is a legacy problem. We have this loop that we're stuck in. We use systems now, and as we add more software capability and more data, they get slower. Well, that's to be expected. So what we do is we take advantage of the increase in hardware speed and complexity. We take advantage of the change in cost. <clears throat> we're able to upgrade our systems often for approximately the same constant dollar as what we paid for the existing one. And we get speed back because the new systems are faster and more capable, have more memory. But we have invested so much in the software, we just transfer the software over, which means the new hardware has to be compatible and the new software has to be compatible. And everything runs on it just the way we want. We do maybe a, a half a day's transfer and there we are. Uh, maybe a little longer if you've got something complex. And by gosh, we've got extra computing power now, so we'll add some more software to it <coughs> until it slows down and we have to get new hardware. Well, we're stuck in a loop. We're stuck in a legacy loop. Because we've invested so much in the software and in the data, we simply do not want to go to something new. And as a result, the hardware that's designed needs to support the old software. And because it's capable, we just add on to the existing software. So instead of being able to do any kind of new revolutionary change, we do very slow evolutionary changes. As I note, Windows was designed in 1989. The basic design of the operating system that most people use now is almost 30 years old. And that is one of the issues that we're not really taking advantage. We're not really projecting forward to the future. And that's why I'm saying that that, that high-speed system that has the whole internet may still be running Windows. And that would be unfortunate, because it means that we're not taking advantage of many of the breakthroughs and ideas that we could otherwise bring to bear. And this leads to problems of another kind, having to do with security and privacy. So for instance, malware. In 1988, the Morris Internet worm uh, got loose on the internet and woke a lot of people up to the problem of malware. It had really been out in the wild starting in 1985. In 1985, there were two computer viruses that had been found out in the wild, as it were, at other than study conditions. And in uh, 1988, there were, were up to 20 that were known globally at the time. Um, we're well over 200 million known pieces of malware today. And the antivirus companies are reporting new signatures at a rate of over 1 million new pieces of malware per day. That's reported over 1 million per day. 
Why are these numbers so large? Well, there's several reasons. One is a difficulty in um, law enforcement in catching up with some of these people and punishing them appropriately. Part of it has to do with lousy software quality, but a large part has to do with compatibility. They know that they can write once and run on decades worth of systems because they're all compatible, backwards compatible. Right now it's estimated that one-third of all computing systems in use have some form of malware on them. So in this room, just look around and think that about one-third of you likely have some kind of virus or ransomware or something else running on your system that you didn't put there uh, and that has potentially some criminal intent behind it. That's part of the legacy problem, is that so many of those old bits of software will support various kinds of attacks. So let me give you a few other numbers of kind of where we are now. Um, we're seeing on the order of over 8,000 to 10,000 security relevant flaws disclosed each year for commonly used software. There are yet more that are not disclosed. Uh, but these are the ones that are publicly reported and are aggregated in databases, and this is an average. So thousands, many thousands of flaws that affect the software that you use on a daily basis that are used by university administration, law enforcement, emergency response personnel, government agencies, banks, stores, and others have all of these flaws that are being found at a constant high rate. And these are flaws that can be exploited by others to steal information, insert software, uh, damage or destroy the systems. The reported losses from computer crime exceed $1 billion a year in the US. Now that's losses. That doesn't even include the amount that's spent on security software that doesn't work, on recovery time, extra backups, investigation, and all the other aspects that go into this. It is a large drain on the economy. Although one billion really is a drop in the bucket for the national economy, it is nonetheless a significant one. We have a huge unreported loss that's many times larger than that of cyber espionage. Some of it is industrial, some of it is political. A great deal of intellectual property is being stolen on a regular basis, uh, primarily by organizations outside the United States being taken from United States uh, companies and government agencies uh, that are effectively used against us. We're paying for the research and whoever steals the information is getting the benefit because they can go to market, they can apply the results without having to do any of the investment in time, uh, money, or sweat equity. And that's a problem. It's a huge outflow that's even greater than the dollar losses. Spam. Um, most of us run at least one spam filter. We don't see all of what comes in. But if you have it unfiltered, it vastly overwhelms all the real mail. Um, it's one reason why many people are switching away from using email. But then the spam just follows onto other platforms. Um, and just recently, the FBI reported on one intrusion set. Uh, and they didn't give a lot of details. But they identified that there were nation state actors that have been operating present on US government systems for a period of at least three years, undetected. Well, that's just one instance that they found. There's lots more. So the state of security right now, even at the highest levels with government, is extraordinarily poor. Uh, we, we are uh, under constant attack. We're losing huge uh, amounts of valuable information and resources. And it is actually getting worse over time. Not as bad as the increase in computing power, but there is a slow, steady increase in the amount of losses. So far in 2016, there have been 70 major data breach incidents that have exposed 2.5 million records of personal information, healthcare information, banking information, your personal information. Uh, last year, there were uh, 226 reported major incidents reported, which means they were detected and admitted to. The number is actually far higher than that for really what happened. But 226 incidents with 260 million records exposed. Uh, one of the more notable ones was the Office of Personnel Management, where people uh, who had various government uh, certifications and classifications had their information stolen and disclosed. 
uh, and Anthem uh, Insurance that had their entire database exposed. And there are more. There are more going on on a regular basis. Uh, the breaches per year have gone down a little bit, but the number of records exposed per breach has gone up. About one half of all trending news items lead to malicious worldwide websites, and uh, ransomware is just a huge growing problem. I could go on and on. There's a lot. And I'll, I'll say this. Uh, there is a problem, but it really isn't new. Uh, some of us have been trying to warn about this for decades. And uh, Professor Tafoya here has heard me at least 20 years ago giving a similar talk. Um, he was much younger then. Uh, <laughs> so was I. Uh, but the, the people involved don't want to listen to this because they have such an investment in the software and in the hardware. And the solutions require spending money and doing some things that require some, some really hard decisions. People don't like to make hard decisions, and they don't like spending money, and that's part of the problem. So instead, we are continuing to lose money, and we're continuing to have to spend, although not making the, the sudden incremental change that really would make a big difference. So as long as we keep on this path, the question is, well, what's coming? What, what is our next set of problems or challenges in this pool of security. And I'll tell you, we're already seeing some of these. One of them is this whole area of technology platforms. Uh, some people call it the Internet of Things, or it used to be called Things That Think. Uh, we are putting computers in nearly everything. And I've got a picture of a car here. Uh, yeah, you all know that your cars have a computer in them. Um, BMW uh, has been at the forefront of this. Uh, this particular model has 80 different computers in it connected by three buses and at least two external wireless connections. And that's standard. That is now coming to your automobiles. In two years, um, the Federal um, Transportation uh, Commission, I think is the one regulating this. Um, it, it's escaping me at the moment. But in the US, the requirement will be that all automobiles have near field uh, communication in them to network with each other, all new vehicles on the road. You don't have a say in this. This is now a requirement. Everything you buy is going to have that in where your car will communicate with other cars on the road and it is ostensibly for safety purposes so that you know about traffic jams and accidents and bad weather conditions. Uh, but the way the standard is written, it also doesn't protect against the fact that as you're driving along, Somebody who's got access to it can beam advertisements into your car to appear on your dashboard. So you can sort of ask questions as to who's actually behind this. Um, I'll leave that to those of you who are more cynical to make a decision. But this is now going to be required on automobiles. They will have network communication for all new models that are sold. That's a place where the Internet of Things is coming into play, and we don't have a lot of choice. Our home appliances now optionally have computers, but some of them are now having them in um, by default, and you don't even know they're there. I have a picture here of a Samsung refrigerator that ha runs Linux. Why do you need a refrigerator that runs Linux? Well, I guess if you really like Linux, you want to run it on everything. Um, maybe this is where you keep Tux the Penguin. Uh, but. Um, it poses new problems. When your household appliances and your utilities are all networked and communicating using an operating system that is known to have problems, at least that is an Android, um, that's going to cause a lot of new problems. Your appliances may be spying on you. I mean, that sounds a little odd, but if you think about it, if someone wants to burgle your house, they'll know if you're home. They'll know your schedule. They'll have some idea what appliances you have and whether, what you can afford and whether or not they may even have video to be able to tell where in the house to go to get things. You won't have a choice over that because it's built in. Uh, there are other kinds of things where the computing is going to be embedded, including things we wear. Um, these are things that are out there now uh, that one sort of, I don't know if that's high fashion or low fashion, uh, those shoes there on the left have built-in networking and MP3 music player so that when you go out, if you don't like what they're playing, you can take yours along with you um, and, and run it off your shoes. Okay. Um, 
watches, high capacity watches with storage, with networking that are available. <clears throat> this is not like an Apple watch or an Android watch. Um, this is a little bit more low tech, but that's an area we're moving to. We have um, jewelry. Uh, one, of my, one of my friends who works at the National Security Agency uh, actually carries a fit fitness tracker that fits in a necklace. And um, she was commenting about how she got it by security several times. They didn't even know it was there. Um, it's built in. Uh, we have RFID trackers that are built into our clothing. Now that's kind of interesting. It's great for inventory because we can easily just walk up and down the aisles of the store and we know what's on the shelf and we know when we bought it. We know how much it's worth. But if those aren't disabled, when people walk by in the street, we know what they're wearing, we know where they bought it, we know what it's worth, and we know they haven't changed it in a while. Um, is that really what we want? That's an invasion of privacy and, and of security. But we don't have a choice because these are so small, they're being built in really without our permission, without our understanding, and we have to deal with it. Communication, as I mentioned, ad hoc networking coming along. Um, and most of this is without logging. That Linux-enabled refrigerator isn't going to keep careful audit logs. So you won't know what happened. Those automobile networks, the cars aren't going to be able to keep uh, uh, any kind of logs with them. And so if there's an accident or a theft or something else, we're not going to be able to recreate the information that was used and present for an investigation without a great deal of difficulty. If we do mandate logging and storage, we now have memory of every place the car has been and maybe the conversations in them and who else was with you, and that opens up a different set of problems. There's not a good choice here. By the way, these are not being designed by people with security and privacy in mind. These are being uh, designed by people who have marketing in mind. They're talking about the great new features. See the ad, I think it's Buick, now offers cars that have built-in Wi-Fi, hotspots. Not a word about how that's protected or firewalled or what you may download or the fact that we don't necessarily want to have the driver uh, watching episodes of the Kardashians while on the road. Um, so highly mobile data, no logging. Uh, sensors in SCADA, real-time control, and sensors are going to be reading what's going on and reporting back and be adjustable by anybody who's able to figure how to get in them. The havoc there is considerable. Uh, I'm going to skip on storage. Let's talk a little bit about bad guys. Um, and I guess bad guy is relative uh, to your point of view. But let's just say that uh, in the area of criminal behavior, um, we're seeing more and more here because law enforcement has not kept up. And the amount of data that we can take and use for extortion, either personal or um, from an organizational standpoint, is significant. Ransomware is an example of this, um, where we will, uh, um, well, there's an extra E in ransomware. Oh, well. Uh, we can um, uh, encrypt your system unless you pay in Bitcoin. Uh, that's an increasing phenomenon that is going to be worse. We see. Uh, distributed denial of service for hire, where organizations will uh, basically shut your system off the network or slow it down drastically in return for payment, and the prices are dropping. Uh, we see various kinds of fraud and identity theft increasing because it is just so possible to steal personal information. So our I online identity is, is greatly at risk, and we're not keeping up with the threat. These threats are getting worse, and um, the enabling technology is getting worse. The fact that we are putting more systems in more places with weaker security means that the criminals are finding more ways in. We're seeing also motivational issues, some blurring of causes. There's espionage at the corporate and national level, certainly, uh, but we also see uh, a, a more political or economic push where countries that have less developed economies are using espionage as a way to jumpstart their economies as a way of getting uh, first world technology and first world resources uh, for their own domestic consumption and use. And this is occurring across a wide range of areas, not only in manufacturing and communications, but we're also seeing this a lot in pharmaceuticals, where uh, third world countries uh, can't 
they can't pay the fees that we normally charge for some modern medicines, and so they're stealing the formulations to manufacture them themselves. Now, there are moral issues there as well as economic issues, and so that's an area that could certainly be discussed. And if any of you are philosophers, I would encourage you to do so because it, it does say something about the, uh, the future. Um, and of course, then we have hacktivism, which is related to this, uh, where we have people who are concerned with social causes. And they use computing as a way of making a statement or as attempting to force organizations or individuals to change their behavior. Uh, we're seeing that for environmental purposes, for instance. Uh, or uh, again, world trade kinds of issues. Uh, instead of having a protest or throwing bombs, we now have people who are getting in and destroying databases or subverting computer systems. Um, I'm going to skip. A, uh, I'll just mention here, um, it's now possible, by the way, if you want to go out and buy a 3D printer and you download the circuitry uh, diagrams off the net fairly free, for a few thousand dollars, you can get a, uh, an electronics factory in China to custom make whatever ICs you want. Then you can custom print the exterior to make it look like an ATM or a Cisco box or whatever else. And you can embed your own electronics where consumers don't know the difference and are going to use them, cost you an investment of a few thousand dollars, and it looks exactly the same, and you can steal or modify the information any way you want. And that's being done today in Europe primarily, but we're beginning to see it in the US. Um, criminals have got the money to invest. They're willing to do it. Our, our government response, well, I can submit something to the NSF. I might get funded in a year and a half. Uh, and then I'm only going to get 80% of what I requested because they don't have enough money. And um, so maybe in three years, I'll be able to address tomorrow's threat that was being paid for by a criminal gang uh, today. And as I mentioned here, governments not so much. The Pentagon's going out and asking hackers to test their security because they don't have the tools or the know-how internally to do it themselves. Uh, we have companies that are now going out and uh, tracking down hackers. Uh, some are probably offering services that you don't see on the regular price sheet. Um, that uh, I do know that there are some European organizations that offer to have in-depth personal conversations with the people hacking your system, uh, resulting in them possibly losing the use of their arms. Um, and that's instead of law enforcement, because law enforcement hasn't been able to respond. Uh, this is likely to get worse before it gets better. All right, so how can we improve? Let me say about five minutes on this, and then open it up for a few questions. The first thing is, we got to get away from how we're treating security. Patching systems is not security, period. When you get a patch for your system, that's an admission of incompetence by the vendor. It is not security because the problem has already been exposed and possibly exploited. The patch is an after the facts fix. Fix. But that's how we approach security. Our view has been get the stuff out the door, get it to market, and we'll fix things afterwards. That's not the right way to do things because that exposes vulnerabilities. Think about any other area. We're going to get the car on the road and we'll fix the brakes later. That's a terrible idea, unless you're the car vendor, I suppose. But that's what we're doing with software on a regular basis and have been doing for years. That's got to change. Because not only are there 8,000 security flaws per year, at least, there are all the other quality and privacy related flaws that cause loss of data and loss of productivity uh, by users. Those of us of a certain age probably don't even want to tally up how many years of person time we've lost staring at a blue screen. Quality affects us all. How are we going to respond to those flaws? We have to do it by producing better quality systems. But that's going to take time and money and getting rid of a lot of the legacy systems that are simply too broken to be allowed to continue to exist. I have also here my second uh, axiom of cybersecurity, which is that without computers, we wouldn't have computer crime. But without people, we wouldn't have computer crime. So why are we focusing only on the computers? We have to focus equally on how people interact with systems, how they behave, 
and how we can influence and, and support the behaviors of people. So cybersecurity really includes all these other things. It is not simply computing. It is computing and psychology and economics and law and physics and a lot of other things that involve people because ultimately people are the ones using the computing and people who are affected by the computing. Let me, whoops. I'm having problems with a button here. Um, that picture may not mean a lot to some of you, um, but the point here, it was one for, for uh, sort of nostalgia reasons. Uh, buying cheap has long-term costs. You can get something and acquire it on the cheap, but the maintenance and the long-term costs are going to potentially be far worse than if you invested in quality up front. There was an IEEE study that showed that the, uh, well, the Poneman Institute did a study and showed that the average security breach resulted in over a million dollars in losses for the company that, with the breach. IEEE did a study and found that those same flaws, if they were fixed at design time, would cost about $500 in programmer time. Why don't we do more of that? It's again because the companies push it out and assume that us, the consumer population, is going to uh, be happy to catch up on patches after the fact rather than having quality in the first place. Uh, let me also mention, I think there are problems with the current government response and in part commercial response uh, because it's centralized. And that isn't how we deal with a lot of distributed crises. Imagine if we had a fire in this building and you had to call DHS in Washington, report the fire, give all the characteristics, and then they would assign a case agent to get back to us in a week as to how to deal with it. That's not a good way to deal with fires or break-ins or medical emergencies. It's not the right way to deal with cyber either. We have to change our structure as to how we are dealing with this as large organizations or we're not going to be able to succeed. But this involves empowering out at the, out at the leaves. It means better education. It means better protection at the, at the uh, endpoints rather than depending upon very expensive centralized fixes. That's going to be a huge change. I don't expect to see it happen in my lifetime. I'm hoping that some of you can perhaps help cause that change. The bottom line on this is those of us working in security should not be the ones saying, no, you can't do that. We should be the ones saying, let me show you how to do it safely. That's how security gets done. People have jobs to do. They have things they want to accomplish. They want entertainment. They want communications. They want storage. They want safety. They don't want to be told no. And they're willing to modify their behavior if we can show them the right way to do it that isn't too inconvenient. That's what we should be doing in security. Not coming up with a list of no's, but a list of here's how you do it. I'm going to actually make that my last slide. I'm going to say that all of us here should be part of a change where instead of saying no with security, which we're not going to be able to get away with anyhow, we want to be in a situation where we can say, let's make it safer. Let's work together to have a better future with better privacy, better technology. And I'm going to leave that up to you. Uh, now that I've told you about it, it's your problem. It's mine, too, and that of a lot of other people, and I'm hoping that we can address it. And with that, I thank you very much for your patience and your attention, and I believe there's a little bit of time for, for me to take a few questions if you have them. <laughs> Bill? Sure. So the question was that, that um, a number of years ago, I, I was famously quoted about encry encryption. Uh, and in those of you who haven't heard it, it's along the lines of uh, uh, encryption on the web is the equivalent of, of using an armored car to take uh, rolls, of penny, rolls of pennies from um, uh, someone under an underpass to somebody doing business on a park bench. Um, the encryption was very, very powerful, but, but the endpoint security was awful. And the, the point was, that's evolved a bit. What do I have to say now? 
Uh, endpoint encryption is still pretty bad. And in fact, most of the national level agencies that are involved in, in doing investigations uh, are fine to have unbreakable encryption out there because most people use it poorly or they use it on systems that are easily broken. Law enforcement, however, uh, has a little bit more of a, of, I don't mean this to sound pejorative, but unfortunately it will. Uh, law enforcement has a more parochial view. Um, so instead of taking the big view, the global view, the long-term view, uh, law enforcement is very interested in solving the crime here and now and stopping the criminals here and now. And so encryption looks like an obstacle to them. Uh, but unfortunately, with the technology the way it is, um, if we make it simple for someone to solve here and now for a case, it's simple to solve for all cases. And that includes in places where people's lives are at risk for expressing their views, uh, where national secrets are protected, commercial secrets. So I still think we have very strong encryption, we have weak endpoints, but I also think we have people who are failing to see its, its appropriate place in the technology chain. Um, and I hope that answers. I'm sure that could engender further, further discussion, but I'll take another question first. Sure. So, uh, and at one example of hard choices is to come up with a different architectural design for the way we're using computers and possibly operating systems on them. Um, for example, right now we have multi-core computing chips and what we're doing with those multiple cores is we're putting virtual machines on them and then in the virtual machines we're loading up versions of Linux or Windows or whatever else to run. And that's not really the best way to use the hardware. There are better ways to use the hardware of partitioning tasks out to those individual processors. But we don't have operating systems that exist that do that. It means replacing some of the programming languages we use now with uh, better type safe languages. It means getting rid of some of the legacy databases and interfaces uh, that we are using now that, that are dangerous or that have flaws. Uh, it's getting away from user expectation that a single uh, and, and producer expectation that a single computer system can run whatever we want on it. Because to do so, that means we have to jettison a number of weaknesses. Historically, for those who study the field, we have a number of highly secured, very tight operating systems. There's one or two, uh, one or two now that are still in production um, that are used in aerospace technologies. But you can't run Word on them. You can't run a web browser on them. And they cost millions of dollars to produce, so they're not available as open source. Those are some of the choices we're going to have to make. Maybe not for every system, but for those that are security critical or data critical. Okay, so, well, I'll go to the gentleman there to Abe's side. That's a really good question, and um, I, I hope people were able to hear it because I can't capture all of it. But the point being that a lot of what we do now, we do by metaphor. And it's because we're comfortable with those metaphors, and we have a very wide generational uh, span, and um, some of us are maybe not as, as comfortable with Snapchats and vaping and a few other kinds of things that are, that are commonplace for others. Uh, so we use those metaphors and we carry those forward as a way of, of representing our, our thoughts. Are we stuck with those metaphors? No, I don't think so. Uh, it, it generally takes some generational change, but not a lot of generational change. Usually a generation 
35 years or so is enough to create a whole new set of metaphors where we talk now about, about a Xerox, a phone call. Uh, we don't talk about uh, horse and buggy anymore. Kind of, well, that's more than 35 years. But even the idea of space, uh, space exploration or space, space communications have moved forward at a, at a fairly rapid pace, and new metaphors take their place. With increased social communication, some of those metaphors take place much faster than they used to. So the technology itself is moving us forward to those discussions. As to how that affects privacy and security, um, that's a little bit harder to predict. You, you talked about shared DNA, for instance, we're, we're probably going to have something like that in 10 to 15 years where we can do fast DNA typing and testing. Uh, those of us with twins and triplets had better be on good terms. Uh, there's, a, there's a rare uh, disorder called chimerism. That means those people may have a little bit of problem depending on which hand they use. Uh, and of course, once we get to the idea of uh, transplants and some of the genetic manipulation for disease, that could throw that all off into another realm. So there are technological developments that will affect uh, each of these areas of discipline. Our social understanding of what it means to have private data, our social sense of what security really is, is likely to change as well. Because of how much information is going to be made available and because of the nature of the kinds of risks around us, whether they are environmental or technological, um, are likely to also change our comfort level with what is exposed and what is not. But we've also seen that same kind of change occur in society in that most, most of what we have as a security environment developed over the last 60 years, last 75 years, uh, in response to uh, the red menace uh, of the Soviet Union. And when they kind of ceased to be an element of, of risk, we had a long uh, time where we we stopped spending on a lot of security, where investments went other places, awareness went other places. Now we're beginning to talk about China and North Korea as adversaries or other economic kind of adversaries. We're beginning to move back into that. Those all, that context certainly changes how we do things. So there are many different possible futures uh, that uh, I just don't have time to address, but, but hopefully that gives you some sense of some things that might might affect where we're going. Abe? Um, I was hoping you can share with us a little bit about your new endeavor um, in deception, in the study of deception. <coughs> say a couple of words about that, uh, if you can. Um, and perhaps uh, uh, one other thing that would be nice to hear about is elections and your view on elections as they relate to cybersecurity and, and computing in general, because it's, uh, it's happening. So All right. Well, let me let me mention about the elections, um, electioneering and voting first. Uh, there are two elements at play here. The first is uh, the the lack of privacy, the collection of knowledge, and the the deep data mining means that each of us may well be receiving information about candidates in the election that is different from everyone else. Highly tailored kind of electioneering. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily good for our representative form of government because each of us has a different view based on what we see in social media but what's also targeted to us. Um, and, and therefore, having a consistent view of what those candidates stand for and what some of the issues mean, um, we don't have that shared basis anymore to form the opinion. I'm not sure that gives us the right information base on which to base our decisions. The second aspect has to do with voting technology itself. We want to be able to have everyone to be able to cast a vote. Ideally, we'd like those people voting to be informed, but that's asking too much, I think, in today's environment. Uh, but we want people to be able to cast a vote that is private uh, to themselves, that they are able to do without any kind of assistance or interference, and to know that their vote is appropriately tallied. We can't do that with electronic voting machines. We can't do that with online voting. Um, it is simply not possible using current technology. That the best voting technologies to do that right now happen to be things like optical scan ballots, uh, paper, that have a paper trail that can then be audited after the fact. Any touchscreen voting machine can be hacked. And internet voting is a bad idea uh, for a number of reasons. Because again, it, it can be changed. Um, 
and, and uh, it's not necessarily private. So this is a challenge we have going forward because what the election process is get the results faster, tally them quicker, involve fewer people, cut down on the cost. At least that's one of the trends in voting. And uh, the technology simply won't support it, but the average person doesn't realize that because most of you use uh, ATMs, you do online banking, and you say, well, why can't I do the same with voting? They're not the same because your online banking and your ATMs are not anonymous. We do know what amount you put in and what bank you're going to. We don't want to do that with elections because that opens the possibility of coercion, uh, of blackmail, of vote buying, and other kinds of, of fraud that are not good for the, uh, for the republic. So th that's a quick response on that. The other one, uh, the work I'm doing on deception um, is just an area of research. It's, it's not a grand theme necessarily. If you're interested in that, uh, there, there are some links on our uh, web page. Well, I've had a couple students do this, but basically most computing systems are truthful. Uh, if you make an error, they give you back an error message that tells you what happened. That's a boon for attackers because if they're trying to get in and it doesn't work and, it, and they're told it's because it's a bad password or the format is wrong, they know what to fix for the next part of the attack. Uh, we use camouflage, we use deception, we use obfuscation on a regular basis. It occurs in nature, we use it in, in human systems. Um, you know, I, I can't go out Saturday night, I'm flossing the cat. Uh, uh, deception is, is, we use it in social situations. We should be using it as a defense mechanism and that's, that's what I'm doing as a, as a research project. Um, we're a little past, I think, the time where where we had allotted for the talk. Um, I'll be around some, and thank you again for your attention. Thank you very much. So on behalf of the college, I'm going to give Dr. Spafford something that has a few transistors, I'm sure, but comes in a very secure and nondescript bag. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you.